Hello, and if you're watching this, which uh, I guess you're watching this, thank you for watching this video. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about the emergence of spacetime through higher dimensional wave dynamics. I'm looking to answer the questions of how and why spacetime exists. I'm going to describe how reality is generated as a three dimensional membrane that gets embedded in a higher dimensional bulk and how four-dimensional space-time emerges by taking entropy to be a conserved value. And uh, during this presentation or this video, you're going to hear me reference the bulk. And when I'm talking about the bulk, that's just a term that uh, cosmologists, physicists, whoever used to uh, talk about whatever might exist beyond the three-dimensional universe, beyond the observable universe. Another way to think of it is you know, what happened before the Big Bang. Uh, the bulk is whatever might exist beyond the universe. I'm going to be proposing a model of space-time where the dynamics of undulating energy fields in a higher dimensional bulk will necessarily produce a universe with three spatial dimensions. I'm going to show how the oscillations that generate matter particles are going to establish another dimension, uh, the dimension of time. I'm going to uh, uh, say why the existence of matter particles will dictate the dimension of time can only be navigated in one direction that direction being from the past and towards the future. Uh, I'm going to break this presentation up into three sections, three main sections, I guess. Uh, in the first section, I'm going to prove that all matter in the universe is generated by a type of oscillation called a knotted scroll wave ring. And that because this type of oscillation can only exist in three dimensions, all the matter in the universe creates a sort of three-dimensional membrane, that is one way to think of it. Uh, basically, I'm going to prove that the universe must have exactly three spatial dimensions. In the next section, uh, I'm going to show that the oscillations that generate matter particles can be viewed as fundamental systems, and that these systems evolve exclusively to highly ordered states. I'm going to show that matter particles are systems that evolve to states of lower entropy. In the third section, I uh, will show that the decreasing entropy of these fundamental systems establishes an exchange of entropy from fundamental systems that generate particles to the larger physical systems that are made of particles. I will show that this exchange of entropy establishes a unidirectional arrow of time, so that as the fourth dimension emerges, it can only be navigated in the direction from the past and towards the future. And then I'm going to conclude this presentation by explicitly stating my conclusions, proving that in any n-dimensional bulk, the fabric of the universe will emerge from the higher dimensional wave dynamics as three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. In this first section, I'm going to answer the question, why do we live in a universe with three dimensions of space? So the laws of nature, the laws of nature could allow for a universe with any number of spatial dimensions. Why the universe has exactly three dimensions of space is an open question of cosmology. In this section, I'm going to propose a definitive answer. I'm going to show that the observable universe is, in, its, in essence, a uh, three-dimensional membrane that gets embedded in a higher dimensional space. Because the structure of the most fundamental components of matter can only exist in three dimensions, this uh, membrane must have exactly three spatial dimensions. Through this presentation, I'll present a good deal of uh, kind of prerequisite information. This is math and science has been well established. To help differentiate between what I'm proposing and what is prerequisite, I've included an icon uh, that would be this icon here. Um, so I've included that icon on slides that are covering prerequisite information. If you see that established icon on slide, it means that what I'm going over are ideas that have already been established. We'll start with some of this prerequisite information in the first section. Uh, that's going to be the standard model of particle, particle physics, excitations, which are those are oscillations in an excitable media, uh, quantum field theory, spinners, which spinners are mathematical objects. Uh, they're kind of counterintuitive, and they're uh, most often the representation of certain kinds of fundamental particles, um, a mathematical representation of those particles. Um, we're going to talk about topological knot theory, and then scroll waves. And scroll waves are three-dimensional excitations. 
And I'm going to close the section by laying out a clear set of premises based on these established concepts and show that they lead to the conclusion that the observable universe must have exactly three spatial dimensions. So this diagram that you're looking at is the standard model of particle physics. Um, the standard model, it's like a it's like a periodic table for the fundamental particles that exist in the universe. So the particles that are in this diagram are the most bedrock components of physical reality. The standard model here is divided into two main sections. We've got fermions, which are over here on the left, and then we've got bosons, which are on the right. Uh, so fermions, the ones on the left here, they are the uh, particles of substance. So all matter is made out of fermions. Um, so anything that's material is made out of fermions, anything tactile. Uh, so all the stars and planets and dust and plants and animals and people. So it, it, basically anything that can reflect light at the most fundamental level, that stuff is all made out of fermions. So just to be clear, uh, matter, generally speaking, matter is made out of atoms. Atoms are made of protons and neutrons and electrons. Protons and neutrons are made out of quarks. Uh, Quarks and electrons are types of fermions. So in that sense, matter is made out of fermions. Bosons, on the other hand, are force carrier particles. They're just quantized waves of pure energy. So they facilitate interaction between fermions by transmitting force from one fermion to another. So for example, photons are particles of light. They're the force carrier particle for the electromagnetic force. And they are what allows light from the sun the sun is made of fermions. They're, they allow light from the sun made of fermions to interact with things here on Earth that are also made of fermions. They are the particle that allows that interaction. Fermions are they going to be the particles that we're interested in for this presentation. Any oscillation requires a medium. The medium is the substrate that houses the oscillation. Uh, so for waves in the ocean, that medium would be the water. For sound waves, that medium would be the air. The difference between those kinds of waves and excitations, which are oscillations in excitable media, um, is that the media of air or water is inert. Um, excitable, excitable media is not inert. So the oscillation propagates through an excitable medium by exciting the state of the medium. So waves are in the ocean are cycles of energy, and they act as a force that pushes and pulls on the water. But there's nothing about the water that changes when there's a wave. Sound waves are pressure waves in the air. They transmit vibrational energy and create differences in air pressure, but nothing changes about uh, an air molecule. An oscillation in an excitable medium changes something about the medium. So this might be a chemical change, which is what we're watching this video here. Um, it could be a change in phase or state, etc. Uh, there's some attribute of the medium that gives it the potential to change in some way. The medium has the potential to be in an excited state. So the medium will oscillate between being its more stable ground state, which is uh, in the red there, and a less stable state of excitement which is this kind of light blue color. And you see how it oscillates back and forth between the red and the blue changing back and forth. And that's, that's an oscillation in an excitable medium. Quantum field theory is the most accurate description of the universe that's been developed so far. It describes the universe as a collection of fields that exist everywhere in the universe, all the time. Particles then exist as as waves in those fields. So these fields, uh, what they are, these are a kind of background of energy that is always present. It's present everywhere throughout the universe. This is called the vacuum energy. So even in totally empty free space, this vacuum energy exists as a kind of a baseline amount of undulating, uh, rippling energy. Each kind of particle in the standard model that we looked at earlier has an associated field. So there's an electron field, there's a photon field, there's quark fields, etc. 
For a particle to exist in the universe, there must by, be an excitation in the field associated with that particle. The particle that exists are these oscillations. Um, every particle in the universe is synonymous with an excitation. Mm -hmm. So for every particle that exists, there's a wave in a field that generates that kind of particle. And that wave is that particle. The fields are the media that house these oscillations or excitations, and the excitations are the particles produced by those fields. The oscillation has to be of a specific quantized amount of energy to generate a particle. So no more or no less energy. That's why um, all electrons in the universe are identical. You, you can't use half the amount of energy to get a half electron. You can't get a double electron. Uh, it's a quantized amount of energy. Uh, added to that field in that kind of localized region that generates an electron. Uh, and that's where we have quantum field theory. So spinners are a counterintuitive mathematical object. They are vectors or mathematically useful arrows that contain their own negatives. Solutions to field equations uh, for fermions will oftentimes represent fermions as spinners. Uh, and then in this video here, it's uh, just kind of keep an eye on it as I'm talking. It's meant to kind of show different visual representations of a, of a spinner, what a spinner is. Um, and hopefully it'll kind of make, start to make sense as I talk. So what we're seeking is a conceptual understanding of the particles make up all matter in the universe. Spinners aren't fermions, but there's a reason that these are chosen to represent fermions. So pinning down what it is about spinners that makes them a useful description of fermions can help us develop the conceptual understanding we're after. Another thing that's uh, kind of used to help convey the idea of what a spinner is, is a Mobius strip, as you see here. And it's a strip, you know, when you look at it, it looks like it has two edges. Um, but if we start here in front of the blue arrow, and we kind of start to trace out, we're keeping our finger on this edge, uh, we make one rotation, and now we're back, without lifting our finger, we're back behind the blue arrow. We make another rotation, now we're back in front of that blue arrow. So, um, a Mobius strip has one edge, and it takes two rotations around to navigate that one edge. Um, and this, it's, uh, it's a little more accessible than a mathematically rigorous description of a spinner. Um, so one way to think about it is that spinners kind of fold in on themselves as they rotate. Uh, so if a spinner rotates for 360 degrees, it will kind of, you can think of it as being inside out. Uh, it needs to rotate for another 360 degrees before it's facing forwards again and right side out. So the gist of it is that a spinner needs to rotate for 720 degrees to be facing the same direction as when it started rotating. So spinners are only a mathematical construct. However, this invention logic has a strange characteristic, which is that they are a reflection of themselves, both the positive and the negative, contained in the same space. It is this strange characteristic that makes them a useful stand-in for understanding fermions. Fermions are more than just a logical construct. They are real. There is a characteristic of a fermion that is familiar as the idea of something as reflection being contained in the same space. The important takeaway from this slide is that the math mathematical representation of fermions is an invention of logic that only exists in mathematical spaces. It is impossible to build a tangible model of a spinner, a spinner that you could hold, because there's something about spinners that doesn't translate to being modeled as a static three-dimensional object. You can create visual representations like the ones in this video, but those representations need to be dynamic, constantly changing and moving, to communicate the idea of a spinner. So spinners aren't perfectly accurate representations of fermions, but there's a characteristic uh, of these spinners that makes them a good fit. It's kind of internal symmetry, and this is not like lines of symmetry in a sphere or a cube, where each half of a sphere or a cube is, a, is identical to the other half across that line of symmetry. There's something unique about the symmetry of a spinner that makes it a better choice for representing fermions. And this is the idea that a spinner has dynamic symmetry, that a spinner is a dynamic reflection of itself.
not theories of field topology that studies closed rings in three-dimensional space. Topology is a field of math that's uh, it's very similar to geometry, but it just classifies shapes by different criteria. So not theory is specific to three-dimensional spaces. Two dimensions, a ring can't cross over itself because there's no in front of or behind for the lines of a ring to pass in front of behind themselves. In more than three dimensions, there's always going to be a way for the ring to unwind itself by moving in directions that uh, might not be available to us in the three-dimensional universe. Therefore, knot theory only works in three spatial dimensions. Um, and then this object that you're looking at here on the left there, uh, this we can see this is a closed knotted ring, and this is uh, this is a trefoil knot which is the simplest kind of knot knot theory. Um, but you can see here that this knot is different than a knot in shoelace, for example. Here, it's a closed ring, so there's no ends to this ring. Uh, you can tie together like you can tie a shoelace. So it's a ring that closes on itself, uh, no ends, and it's threaded, th it's threaded through itself in such a way that this could never be unwound. A more accurate local solution to fermion field equations represents these particles as a kind of three-dimensional oscillation that's called a scroll wave. So fermions are generated by oscillations, so it's fair to say that fermions are these oscillations. The oscillations aren't static objects, they are dynamic events. In that sense, modeling a scroll wave is a mathematical construction just like a spinner. And just like with spinners, there is something about a scroll wave that's difficult to pin down in a model. However, a scroll wave is a more accurate model of a fermion as an oscillation. While spinners are the answers for field equations that might describe large numbers of particles, studying scroll waves is like zooming in on just one particle. Scroll waves paint a more detailed picture of the structure of a fermion. A scroll wave is uh, technically it's it's any three-dimensional oscillation propagating from a phase singularity in an excitable medium. So a phase singularity is a, it's a region of oscillation where all phases of the oscillation are contained in that same place. The standard example is the idea of what time it is at the North Pole. Uh, the surface of the Earth is divided into 24 time zones. The time of day in any location on Earth can be thought of as a 24-hour four hour long cycle or a 24 hour long oscillation. However, since all time zones converge at the north and south, north and south poles, at those points, it is always all times. And because it's all times, it's no particular time at all. So the North Pole is a phase singularity of the oscillating time of day on the surface of Earth. Now, scroll waves propagate from a one-dimensional phase singularity that sort of runs through the center of the scroll wave. This is called the scroll wave's filament. And as where the North Pole is like a single zero-dimensional point on, this, uh, on the surface of the Earth, the filament, this phase singularity the scroll wave propagates from, uh, it extends out into one dimension. So it's a one-dimensional line. Um, and the scroll wave kind of rolls out from this filament like a paper scroll would roll off of a dowel. Uh, the scroll wave itself is a dynamic event, and that's difficult to model. If we focus on the f scroll wave's filament, it makes conceptualizing the kind of scroll wave that is a fermion particle a much more attainable task. So the kind of scroll wave that accurately accurately represents a fermion as an excitation of a fermion field, it has a filament that curls around itself. So the ends of this filament, this one-dimensional one line, they connect to one another and it forms a ring. But more specifically, as that ring is forming, the ends of the filament thread through the center of itself. Uh, so it forms a knotted ring. And because knot can only exist in three dimensions, this one-dimensional filament gets embedded in three dimensions. 
Now, the formation of a knotted filament, uh, it requires the chirality of wave propagation from that filament reverse itself. Uh, this prevents the wave fronts from colliding and breaking apart the filament. Um, and this can be seen on the picture on the right here, the, the idea of uh, chirality reversal. Um, so the filament twists. It uh, twists either uh, clockwise or clockwise. I guess the chirality of the wave propagating from that filament is either clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, and there needs to be points like this right here where that chirality will reverse itself, and that's called a perversion of the chirality. So the type of scroll wave that accurately, accurately, accurately represents a fermion, um, it's a knotted, twisted scroll wave ring. It means that it propagate, it's a scroll wave that propagates from a knotted, twisted filament. Um, so let's recap what we've gone over in this section, and uh, hopefully you'll find that we made some headway towards understanding towards our conceptual understanding of fermions, the conceptual understanding we're after. So fermions are our excitation of fermion fields. They are waves in these fields. The kinds of dynamic excitations that are fermions seem to behave as dynamic reflections of the self, of themselves. And we can understand this characteristic of fermions by looking at spinners. They also propagate from a structure that it can be found inside the oscillation, uh, that's the filament. Um, but the structure of that filament is a knotted, twisted ring. And we can understand that by looking at scroll waves. And uh, with that, we're now ready to answer the question that we posed at the beginning of the section. Why does the universe have three spatial dimensions? Given these premises. One. All matter that exists in the universe is fundamentally composed of fermions. Two, the existence of a fermion is synonymous with an oscillation propagating from a phase singularity. Three, the phase singularity that exists as a part of a field oscillation that generates a fermion must have the spatial structure of a topological knot. Four, knot theory is specific to three-dimensional spaces. Uh, given those premises, we are led to the logical conclusion that all matter in the universe must exist in exactly three spatial dimensions. However many dimensions of space there might be in the bulk, all of the fermions can only exist in three dimensions. We are made of fermions, so we are observers embedded in three dimensions. All the matter in the universe, all the stuff in the universe that can be seen, everything that can be observed, this is all made of fermions and therefore can only be observed to exist in three dimensions. The observable universe is a three-dimensional membrane embedded in a higher dimensional bulk.